Hi, good. everyone. Yes. <laughs> I can't see anything. <laughs> Welcome to World Building from Reality. Um, my name is Whit Taylor. Um, I'm a cartoonist and I'm an editor, and I have some lovely guests here with me today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to give you an idea of what the structure is going to look like for today. Um, so after we do intros, um, we're just going to have some conversation, I'm going to ask some questions, general, specific, and then towards the end you'll have about 10 minutes or so to ask questions and there should be mics that will come up um, in the um, aisles, all right? Awesome. And uh, you'll get to see some artwork too. All right, so uh, first I have with me Gabrielle Bell, and you'll have to excuse me, I have all their bios on my phone, so I'm gonna have to keep clicking around. Gabrielle is a British-American cartoonist currently based in Brooklyn. Her comic, Cecil and Jordan in New York, was adapted for the film anthology Tokyo by Michelle Gondry. Her first full-length graphic memoir, Everything is Flammable, was recently published by Uncivilized Books. All right, Chris W. Kim is from Toronto, Canada. He graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design and has done illustration work for several magazines and newspapers. Herman by Trade is his first graphic novel. He posts illustrations and short comics on chriswkim.com. And towards the end, I'll give everybody's table numbers so that you can um, go check out their work afterwards. Um, Ethan really is a cartoonist and illustrator from Toronto. His one-man anthology comic series, Pope Hats, from Ad House Books, has received Doug Wright, Ignatz, Joe Schuster Awards, as well as Eisner Award nominations. He has illustrated for Slate, Harper Collins, Complex, Wired, Chronicle Books, The Walrus, and The Believer. He now lives in Montreal with his wife and brown dog. <laughs> Um, Lauren Weinstein's Ignatz nominated comic Normal Person could be found weekly in the Village Voice. Um, it just ended its print edition, so it might be online, not sure yet. <laughs> Sometimes her work can be spotted in the New Yorker. She has published three books, Girls Stories, Inside, Vinyland, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and Goddess of War. Currently, she is working on a teenage memoir tentatively entitled How to Draw a Nose and a frontier comic for youth in decline. All right. <laughs> so I think this topic is special because usually when we think about world building, we tend to think of genres like sci-fi or fantasy or things that are not necessarily uh, a lot of the things we come to see at SPX. So things like memoir, autobio, slice of life types of stories. And so I think this is a really good opportunity to explore that because it does take a lot of effort and consideration and thought um, to do world, build, world building in those sorts of stories as well. So um, some of the things that I guess we're gonna talk about, aside from just like character building and physical environments or even things just like decisions around language um, and all the little details that go into world building. So you guys can just feel free to jump in um, whenever you want. Um, so the first thing is, how do you define world building for yourself? Should I start? <laughs> um, can you hear me with a mic? And a, um, I, uh, I think it's just par for the course of making something believable is to um, <laughs> uh, just, you want to figure out where somebody lives and what they dress like. And um, so it's very important that that ring true. And so I actually do a ton of research um, on uh, details of somebody's house and somebody's life and what they might wear. And I think way too much about it. And I go down way too many rabbit holes in the internet. Um, and that's about, that's how I, I mean, it's it just this, if you, I never just think about one little part of a story, I think about everything else involved with it. Um, I guess that's how I define it. Um, I would also add that uh, it, there's a certain, once you have your world <laughs> established, it's something to do with some kind of logic. Like if it's a world in which somebody can fly <laughs> or you know something illogical happens and you want it to be sort of consistent with that you know like a world building in terms of 
creating a logic and creating an alternate reality. Whether it's everybody is really sad, <laughs> so it's a sad world. <laughs> <laughs> or it's a somber, like there's a certain, you want to like have like a sort of vague set of rules in your head in which to keep consistent with the world that you've created. Yeah. I think that makes sense because I guess my work is sort of more surreal. So it's more, it's kind of like you said, it just has to be kind of cohesive more than anything. So it's just, does it feel right? Because I'm not like building a crazy token-esque system for my world. So I just, yeah, I just have to be like, does it feel correct? So it's a lot of trial and error more than anything, I think, to do world building in the kind of stuff I want to make. my turn to talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, I guess there's a theme that's coming up, which is um, that I feel like any decision you're, you make as a cartoonist is a decision towards world building. It's like, you know, when you see a movie and you just, you can't stand how someone, some character reacts to someone else, and you're like, that person would never say that. That doesn't make any sense. It's the opposite, the opposite of that, where you're trying to build kind of a dynamic where there's conviction, it's realistic, and, and once you do that, you've created you know, a cohesive world. And it doesn't matter if they're you know, flying dragons or, or you know, you're in space, or if it's uh, you know, what we would call, or the equivalent of literary, literary fiction in comics. Um, you still are making all these decisions that uh, determine what your world is like. You know, do your characters swear or not? Are there swear words in mm -hmm. your world? Um, you know, are you know, are there consequences to when the character mm, makes certain yeah. actions? If there isn't, then maybe that's a comment you're making mm. on the world itself. You think that you know, morality is going in a certain direction. So um, I think that you know, world building is is a really important part of the creative process for anyone. And yet, sort of intuitive as well. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I mean, there are probably parts of world building that you wouldn't be able to avoid as an artist. Like, it's really hard to, I mean, like, I was thinking recently about, like, the way people structure stories, and there are all these manuals for, like, the three, uh, three-act system in Hollywood and stuff like that. But I think it's actually, like, you know, the way you structure a story is actually really interesting. It's um, if you have an impulse towards structuring it a certain way, you know, a way you deal with the endings of stories, it's actually a big part of uh, how you express yourself as a as a person and as an artist and kind of how you see the world. That's that's my thought, anyways. <laughs> so the way that you structure a story reflects on how you interact with the world. Yeah, I mean, like you know, there's always pressure to kind of like wrap a, a neat bow at the mm -hmm. end of your story and say like you know da 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 and it's <laughs> it's over, or like you know something or end on a hopeful note, you know, but some people just kind of, they can't help themselves, they can't do that, you know, mm -hmm. they, I, I don't know if I'm one of those people, but I've thought before where, you, you know, you, you can kind of feel that pressure of, you know, well, the audience wants this, yeah. but I naturally feel like doing something else, and that's kind of part of your own personal world building, it's, uh, and I think it's like, I feel like you should avoid that pressure, you should, you know, if it, you know, more so if it's something that other people wouldn't do, you should do it. And kind of, you should explore that part of yourself. Mm. That kind of makes me think about um, abstraction, which I think is a large part of comics, of you know, observing the world and then making that decision, either consciously or not, of what to include and how to represent it. Um, and how do you feel like that process has changed for you over your career? Like, how do you think that the choices that you've made with your world building has changed? Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, so I'm on a weekly deadline every week for the Village Voice. Um, and I try and build, sometimes, each week I try and make the most fully realized little four panel world that I possibly can do. I like try and cram as much uh, shorthand for things as I can into each one. So it's kind of on a case by case basis. But the 
what you're talking about abstraction really rings true to me because there are so many things that you just have to allude to uh, in this particular format that have no, you can't, you know, there's no other pages. It's just if somebody sees this, they have to imagine the rest of the world. So it's been very crucial for me to think about things in the most iconic and abstract way possible. Like, what's this quick read that somebody's going to get of, say, like a rock festival? Like, the, the, what's the most r shitty rock festival thing I can possibly think <laughs> of to put in this thing? And it's like the line for the bathroom and somebody having a religious experience when they come out because they're on some <laughs> kind of weird drug or something. Um, so, so it's just these, I, I think about these things constantly and I think I used to think more concretely about architecture and stuff like that but now it's really just these little iconic things um, that uh, that yeah. are important for the strip. Yeah. I, I kind of I, I feel like I know what you're talking about it's like sometimes you can pull out a very specific detail and yeah. it actually might not even seem relatable but by being so idiosyncratic, it really represents the whole right. of what you're uh, trying to convey. Right. So yeah, oftentimes uh, when there's a detail and it seems like it has no utility in a story, mm -hmm. I'll actually try to like just force it in because it uh, really paints like a broader picture behind the panels. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like those details. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, this is my first book, so I don't really have anything building off of past work, because <laughs> it's the first one. But I guess uh, when I tried to do the book, Herman by Trade, I, I scrapped like two or three versions of it. And then I found at least that with each iteration, I kept taking stuff out, but I still kept it in mind, like I took out a subplot, but I still imagined he had that experience. So it was sort of alluding to it, like I don't know, if maybe it's just in my head that it actually enhanced or enriched him in some way. But I think, and that's sort of what I try to do now, like I imagine there are side stories going on in the world, but I don't explicitly, you know, tell them in the story. This It'll hopefully make it richer in some way. Um, I think that's kind of where I want to go more and more. In your first versions, were you actually following different characters and then you decided to just yeah. follow the main character? Yeah, there were like more characters and there was more that the main guy was doing. And then as I just got more frustrated and started throwing pages out, I just went like, oh, just get rid of everything. Just stick to the main plot line. Right. And I think it actually helped in a lot of ways. Right. Um, but I'm still fairly new at it, so I'll see how it goes. Yeah. Gabrielle, you, you make worlds that are based on your own reality sometimes. Mm -hmm. How do you change them based on the story? Like, do you ever find that that's hard to do? Mm. Yeah, because like some stories are straightforward autobiographical stories, and some stories are sort of dream sequences or fantasies, and it does, like, I, it has to be with, it has something to do with the tone. Like, I, like if something magical happens, I have to sort of set it up in a way where it's a surprise, but at the same time, the tone is set for it. Um, I don't know how else to say that, but uh, it does have something to do with, um, like if you can do fantastical things, if magic things happen, it's important to really ground it in reality. Like something, pay attention to very specific details of day-to-day -day life, and that makes the magic things more believable and acceptable mm -hmm. in a way. How did you decide to start doing that, the magical realism thing? Like, did it just come naturally, or like, when was the, the point where it started to make sense for you? Honestly, it was boredom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was like, I wanted to do something special, like, because I was just, you know, I always kept a comic diary, and I was always writing about myself, and, and I think that's a still think it's a great thing to do, but I would just get so sick of my own life and my boring life. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, dress it up and like make a 
show of it. So I think it really did sort of come with like self disgust <laughs> and boredom. <laughs> Two key, key ingredients for any good cartoonist. Yeah, it's most cartoonists. She's, yeah, she's not yeah. alone. That's just cartoonists. I, I, I don't know if this uh, echoes what she said, but I, I actually, um, in the first issue of my series, I had uh, uh, halfway through the story, there's a character that appears. It just comes through the wall and it's a ghost and it's talking and it, it speaks in very absurd language. It's like always non sequiturs. It's kind of like an easy laugh for the audience. And uh, it took me a long time to get around to doing the second issue. And by the time I decided to do the second issue, I actually just focused on the main characters. And without any explanation, I got rid of the ghost. Um, and I don't, like, it's not that I'm against, I love those types of comics, uh, but I felt for, I guess what I really wanted to accomplish with um, making comics, it felt more, like, honest for me to just, um, to really focus on the boredom of mm -hmm. life. Like, I actually wanted to, like, explore mm. that. And uh, it just kind of, it wouldn't balance out if I had this, you know, comic relief character. Yeah, it's true that, like, some stories they just they just have to be straight, straight yeah forward. right right do you have a way of um recording your observations because i feel like you have to be observant if you're a cartoonist like you're seeing things all around you do you keep notebooks or like how do you incorporate those things into your work um, my phone and my uh, computer desktop is just like a mess of <laughs> memo notes and like notepad, notepad um I guess the application is just notepad. I don't use Word even. It's just like filled with them. And for some reason, that's why I do it that way. Uh, probably because I always have my phone on me, so. Don't we all? Yeah. yeah. I try and just write stuff down. I almost always have a piece of paper with me. I almost feel like naked without one right now. Um, uh, but, uh, although I, there's no pen. Um, the, but I think, um, Keeping, I also like to talk about people <laughs> with other people, and then I'll remember it a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, so, those are just ways. Uh, but keeping lots and lots of notes is super important. Yeah, I, I concur. I think that uh, like 80 or 90 percent of the story actually is done on little notebooks. Like, if I sit down to write a story without stuff in my notebook <laughs> to refer back to, then it's often just nothing happens. Like, it, story sort of happens in life, whether it's a fictional story, a non-fictional, the story happens when you're going through the day. So it's really good to write stuff down because it's easy to forget. Especially dialogue. I feel like there's just certain mm -hmm. ways that people say things that you can't make up yeah. and you mm -hmm. can't, like, just, and, and I'll write this stuff down and it really will trigger Oh yeah, that's I remember being on that train and hearing that person say that thing in just that way, and I love that. <laughs> yeah, like a, a secret fear I have is just every single character I have sounds like the way I think, mm -hmm. just ter like terribly boring. So like people agreeing with each other. Uh, so uh, yeah, actually research. Uh, I think you were talking about that. Um, I was actually uh, so part of my story. Uh, involves a corporate law firm, and I've never been in a law firm, but uh, I did a lot of reading to kind of get a sense of the personality type that would be attracted to become a lawyer, and the um, kind of innate competitiveness in that environment. So I guess this kind of relates to world build building in that um, using that, you know, the world building really actually just comes out in the opinions people have the way they talk and mm -hmm. the things that they care about. And it's not really so much as just like I'm drawing a nice background, even though that is part of it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that I think it really helps uh, have uh, kind of give you a, a real strong sense of location, which I think is, I mean, personally, like all my favorite records and, and like, you know, novels have the strong sense of time and place. And uh, I'd like to do something like that. So I try to think about 
you know, with scenes, like the types of people involved, the impact the location has on the person. And, you know, as you move through different environments, like if you, I guess a, a common thing that happens in my story is, you know, the main character goes from work to home and home is a much more relaxed place. You know, it's like dark and intimate and, you know, it's either with her best friend her roommate or not, but it's it's like a reprieve from work. So um, I think just that that emotional reaction from you know room to room, and also um, the characters involved in those different you know places. She's you know the character is not going to come across these competitive lawyers at home. I think that helps uh, give the the story a sense of conviction. That's the theory. So I want to ask you maybe one or two more general questions and so I can get into more specifics and you half answered something I was going to ask you about the corporate law firm okay. environment. Um, so thank you. But <laughs> um, So what do you find personally the most challenging thing for you um, when you're world building? And I'm going to add on to that. What is your least favorite thing to draw? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm going through this right now. So I'm, I have been, for the last 12 years, I've been working on the um, uh, sequel to this book I did a long time ago, Girl Stories. And it's about my high school. And when I was, uh, I don't know, 30 or something, I, I, I snuck into my high school and pretended I was a teacher. I'd use the Jedi mind trick on people. <laughs> and I just took lots of pictures and I put that into a scrapbook. And that became the basis of research for all the images that I put into my book now. But I almost find sticking to it slavishly really problematic um, because at, one, at some point the world needs to take off from what actually happened in high school and it needs to become its own world. And I find that that to me is, is one of the worst, most daunting things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate drawing cars, but like um, I think the that is the biggest overall issue I have with world building right now is that I don't, um, everything's kind of of a piece when I draw it, like some things are hard to draw, some things aren't hard to draw, but whatever, they all just go in. It's more, it's what world is it that exactly that I'm trying to get at with this book that I'm working on? Um, uh, how close is it to reality versus when do I jump off? I've spent, you know, hours looking at like Google Street View of a street that I was once on, trying to remember what it was like, looking at the differences between my memory and what it really is, and then asking myself, does it even matter? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so those, those are the, it's when you get lost in some kind of world that's not quite the world that you've made. It's this sort of, here's the real world, here's the way it was in 1987, 1995, now. And here's the one you're trying to create. And I find that that's, that's the trickiest part for me. So you look at the Google Street images, and you're probably, I'm guessing, like, you're trying to find, like, sharpen that image in your mouth, in, yeah. in your mind. You're, like, trying to get even more of it. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're trying to, like, there's, like, there's something very vague about a memory and like something very sharp about it too. So yeah. then you go to this image, but then it's like something completely different. Yeah, and it takes you further away because yeah. maybe on that Google Street View that day there was construction on the house from, you know, that was built in the late 1900s that um, is now, or 1800s, I don't know. It, things change and so then you look at it and it's not exactly what you wanted at all. And so it takes you further away. Mm. Yeah. So references, I guess, are best just for very sort of rudiment, like superficial, I don't know if that's right. They're just like what things generally look like. Yeah. Like, or just like details. But you seem, a, well, you seem obsessed with details. Like, I was just looking at that Victorian, like, even the way the, you know, like the paint goes halfway up the wall. <laughs> um, the, in the, like that third image there. Not there. Well, that even, even just like, that so clearly is a brownstone. I mean, you're always drawing from life. <laughs> this one, like where you've got, you didn't well, just make that up, did you? I probably looked at images. Yeah. I wanted to look, I wanted it to look 
fancy. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I wanted it to look like wildly ostentatiously wealthy, but it actually just kind of looks regular. <laughs> <laughs> But, sorry, I kind of derailed that topic there for you, Whit. <laughs> no, I mean, I asked two questions that weren't actually related to each other. <laughs> so, um, anyone else? Anything that you find particularly challenging about world building? Uh, I think I like to uh, focus on his gesture, like the way people talk with their hands and mm -hmm. just the way people yeah. position their bodies. And I think it can be really evocative of... Uh, like it can be, help, it can help be helpful for characterization, and and especially you know you can actually track a conversation and make it change based on how people uh, you know shift their bodies. So one thing I found really difficult to draw, and I, I can't stand it, is just like the most mundane things. I I redrew a man pulling out a chair from a big dinner table to sit down. And it's just like, you don't, as a cartoonist, you want to be efficient and you don't want to waste your time on small things. But it was literally like, I, I had in my mind, you know, a guy is going to sit at a dinner table. That's, that's it. But um, I figured out that, it, you know, the way people do that is really different than the way I had it in my mind. Like, the way you grab a chair is not, like, in my mind, it would just be like, you're sitting like this. But actually, it's like, you grab the chair here instead of, like, in the corner. It was weird. It was just like, I spent way too long on it. Yeah. But after I finished it, I was like, that's an awesome drawing of a guy yeah. pulling up the chair. <laughs> I was like, I don't care if no one notices. I did that. But you know? people notice, I think, subconsciously, which yeah. is even, like, People don't think about it so much, and in a way, you want to work yeah, on these things. And like in that, you want know, it in, to be invisible. In that particular scene, it certainly wasn't the focus. Like mm -hmm. It wasn't about that, uh, but I really wanted, I guess I was just trying to show the action of people settling in mm -hmm. in a group dinner situation, which is kind of, I mean, it's kind of awkward. People mm -hmm. are figuring out where to sit. Yeah. So um, yeah, I find often it's like those things that derail your your I, I guess your schedule for drawing is stuff that I, I can't predict at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Something. I feel like, yeah, no, I've had that exact same experience. Like, I've restructured a page because I can't draw. Like, a guy walking away at a three quarter angle with his right, right foot behind his left. Right, right. It's really hard sometimes. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> but it's so important. Like, when you figure yeah. out that it's not, like, it doesn't look right, it's not giving you the right feeling. Yeah. Like, you kind of really have to solve that problem. Yeah, and it's. Like the paper gets ruined because you're just erasing it and drawing it again, and then you draw like an amazing cityscape. The next one, you're like, huh? That was yeah, easy. Right. <laughs> just move the yeah. camera away from yeah, whatever just <laughs> you had a problem with. But yeah, I know what you mean. All right, so I have some uh, specific questions for um, all of you guys. So I'll start with you, uh, Gabrielle. You already kind of uh, talked about the magical realism thing. That was the first thing I was going to ask you. But um, are there any other considerations that you keep in mind when you're writing from, like you're doing memoir or autobio, especially in terms of like dealing with people who are actually in your life and representing them? I just try to make people look good so, just, so no one will be mad. <laughs> good answer. I mean, I try to make them look not just physically good, but just I try to make people seem likable, I, I guess, because I don't know, I don't want to uh, defame anybody's character or anything. It is a kind of a, a delicate thing, because uh, when I write about myself, I can do as much as I like, as much as I feel comfortable, with, like I can expose about myself whatever I, whatever I feel comfortable with, but everybody is so unique in that some people don't want this talked about, like some particular thing, and it has nothing to do with the thing itself, it's their association with it. So I have to be, I think, a bit t t tactful with it, I think. Um, I didn't used to be so careful. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there is something about when somebody else writes about you, they're using you as a puppet <laughs> and um so you have to, i want to be as like a most benevolent puppet master <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's something that comes with time as you're doing autobio and you people get mad or upset with representation sometimes and yeah. all of that. So But I think it's also like it can be like honoring somebody to put them in a comic yeah. as long as, <laughs> as long as they don't as long as they don't mind. All right. So Chris, um, one thing when I was reading um, your book that kind of blew me away was how you draw crowds. Um, mm -hmm. They're really intense, as you can see up there. Um, and just like, I mean, the amount of detail, it like really, um, I found to be really unique. So I guess a big part of this story um, is just like the vast array of characters who are essentially, um, I don't want to like give away the whole story, but I'll just say there's a there's a part of the story where they're auditioning for this performance, and there's all these like street performers and entertainers. Um, how did you like come up with all the character designs for those characters? Yeah, um, well, I have like a big file of faces, like you know, I have a lot of anatomy references and all sorts of things, architecture, but I mostly have faces, just because if you if I had to draw anything, I would just draw faces all the time. Um, but then I also, I like I watched a lot of movies with appropriate, you know, types of characters. Like um, I watched some Fellini films because he has a lot of circus people in them. And then just on the street as well, like using my phone again to take a lot of snapshots of people, like trying not to be too obtrusive, but I want to get, get their face. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's just, I really enjoy doing it and it's a bit of a, it's part of the world, I think. Like, it's actually, I want it to be like a big teeming mass, and it's on the border of being kind of disturbing. Like, it's almost too many people. Um, is the part of the character of the world that I wanted. Because um, I wanted, like, the, the overwhelming feeling of, like, a festival or a circus, that kind of thing. And, um, I mean, what do you, it's full of people there, so. Was yeah. there a specific city that this was designed um, around? Yeah, it's Toronto where I live. Okay. Because they have a waterfront. And then for this uh, comic, I kind of imagined like the whole city is just along a waterfront and almost nothing exists outside of it, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't. It's not actually something explicit in the story, but you rarely go outside of that, uh, that area. Like you'll see half city, half water. And uh, yeah, again, I just wanted to hone in, like in previous versions, I had more, but I just thought, to me, that's an interesting idea. And I wanted to just push it in a abstract, like in a surreal way, as far as I could. Um, so yeah, that's why I went with it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so Ethan, I'm gonna um, jump to you. Um, so one thing I noticed about Popat's number five, like you were mentioning, is that it takes place in this law firm. There's also like a home life as well. But what really like um, stuck out to me about the um, law firm was the language, your use of language. And I feel like I mentioned before, like language is a big part of world building. And you mentioned, I was, I was first going to ask you if you'd worked in a law firm before. Um, how did you get the language down for that? Uh, well, I mean, I've never been approached by a lawyer and been told that it's right, so I actually don't know if I got it at all. <laughs> I kind of just made it up. Uh, I mean, I think, I don't know, I like, so the closest thing I've experienced in my personal life is I worked uh, for the Ontario government in Canada uh, as a policy advisor, and there, there's a certain amount of bureaucracy, but it's also kind of, uh, it's, it's like a pretty slow environment, you know, it's government, so not a lot gets done. <laughs> it's a lot of approvals. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like anything, like, uh, you can kind of easily imagine that, t you know, you can take things to the logical conclusion if you want to um, embellish it a bit. And so, um, for a law firm, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely different. The one thing that I was thinking about a lot, about how people go about their days, is uh, the billable hours uh, structure of, you know, they, they bracket off their their hour into three billable segments and everything gets billed at different rates based on how experienced or impressive a lawyer you are. And then people who work for them have to kind of support this whole system. 
So time is like very, very valuable to these people. They get really impatient when you know someone's slow with their food order or something like that. But uh, you know, you just kind of follow that personality, and then you think about what files they're working on and what is important to them, what isn't. You know, often it's other people, and um, you know that's just all part of, I guess, fleshing out the environment. Uh, but I, you know, at the same time, it's I'm doing that, but it's all really just to service my story. Like you have, uh, like in my story, there's a lot of this really lame thing that you see a lot in TV shows where it's like you start the scene and people are ending a conversation. So you can kind of throw any couple of lines together. So often I'll just make up the names of companies and like, I don't know, just describe some offshoot drama that I'm not gonna follow up on in the story. That's kind of fun actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like, hopefully it has some sort of ring of truth to it. I mean, it felt very high stress. So I feel like, I assume that's what working in a law office is like. Yeah, so I think, yeah, was, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. it's good. I mean, they have like a high suicide rate and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. alcoholism. Uh, but you know, at the same time, it's not, I'm not like really just writing about that. I'm just yeah. writing about cultures, like work cultures that are like that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, 10 minutes. All right, Lauren, quick question. <laughs> um, so you actually answered part of what I was gonna ask you before about like what are the, constra like, the constraints of working in a magazine and then how do you work around that to create mm -hmm. these environments? Um, how do, I guess, how do you come up with your themes on a weekly basis? I try and take the mental pulse of New York City, or what I imagine to be New York City, city and mix it together with, um, you know, whatever I'm feeling. It's basically what I'm feeling, right? But I like it. But um, if there's something really big in the news that's going on. So, oh, this was just like, um, things that were in my mom, my parents' fridge um, and th comparing it to my own fridge. and um, But uh, uh, I don't know. How do I do it every week? I don't know. I just, um, <laughs> I have a deadline. And, um, and so it, I just have to make choices based on that deadline. But here's the weird thing about the weekly thing is that it, you got to submit it. You submit it on Monday. It comes out Wednesday, and so if you're so beholden to whatever news there was, you can just know that it's totally different. So, like, yeah. I don't. I have long ago given up on having that amazing pithy uh, thing that's about whatever Trump said because it's going to be totally different in two days. Like, the, this is going to be a totally different world. Um, so I just make decisions based on just the feeling and the mood of what I, what I feel around me, and then I try and put it two days up and see what happens. And, um, and also I try and make it timeless, so all yeah. those things. Timeless, well that's, you know, that's always the hard thing with a weekly, is that yeah. like timeless versus you wanna just have that thing that's gonna go viral on the internet. And I, I, I want, Air on the side of, I mean, I, like, I feel like I just put together all the, the normal person comics that I did for the whole year, and I do feel like it's a really interesting time capsule, um, and just reading through the whole thing um, make, made me, for, like, I'd already forgotten about a couple things that happened earlier this year, but. Um, it's been quite a year. Yeah, sure has. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I, I also like that I get the chance to be timely in my work. Like that's, I fi find is a huge gift about what I get to do. Um, because I think I'm not just stuck in some other world making a comic. I'm like alluding to things that are happening right now. Um, but, and yet I'm not like a political cartoonist either. Though sometimes it's hard not to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, so we have a few minutes for questions. So there's mics and, uh, is it just this aisle? Okay, cool. So if, if you want to line up, um, we can just, five minutes now, okay. <laughs> five minutes. Is this volume all right? Yeah. How do you get into the heads of different characters and make their personalities believable in such a condensed space? 
Good question. <laughs> well, one thing is I do kind of insert sometimes people or you know, people I see in my work or just day to day. And I just try to think what, if I had to encapsulate them, like what do I remember that person said that really stuck with me? And I'm like, ah, oh, that's totally John. And then I just put it in there and hopefully it's, you know, it just clicks. So that's one thing I do. It's kind of like when you're uh, like a disaster film, you've got buildings falling and everything, that's fine. But the thing that people connect to is just the reactions, the reaction shots of the crowds going, oh no. Uh, and it can be the same with people, like you can actually not introduce the character at all and just have people emotionally responding to that person. Like if it's an abusive person, they'll be like, oh God, we have to see this person. Or you know, you can create a myth around someone. So uh, it's not only what a person says, but it's kind of the reverberations around that. Yeah, I think gesture drawing is also just really important, getting the whole figure in. It's not just about, mm. you know, like it's, it's the whole character. Um, yeah, it's got to do with like their body language and their yeah. it's part of their self. Also, I think it really helps to think about what they want. Like if you know what they want or even what they're obsessed with, they're good. you're going to know how they're going to react to every situation. Like. Um, uh, my character Red Riding Hood really wants to uh, <laughs> she wants her grandmother's treasure <laughs> so she'll do whatever however situation she'll react it will be um, wh whatever will get her closer to, to, to that and then she has no scruples so she'll be fake or <laughs> not, not their traditional story but um, so yeah her the character's ethics or their principles, and also, most importantly, what they want and how they'll get, a, yeah. get to it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, when you sit down to write, draw, world build, does it feel like it's deliberate or does it feel like a revelation? Does that make sense? I want it to be a revelation, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> that's what—that's a feeling I wanted to have. Like it just came to me, but it's mostly just me, again, trial and erroring it. That's like the goal that I work towards, probably, but I won't achieve it. <laughs> yeah. It's a very upbeat panel. <laughs> yep. It depends. I mean, a lot of times it is just like homework, especially with things like backgrounds you know you're just kind of going in there and then maybe it adds up to something and maybe it doesn't but it's just um yeah <laughs> that's about it. i concur <laughs> last question hi um were there things are there things that you had in earlier comics that you feel like took away from world building that you now omit on purpose like are there like details that you found distracting in world building that like you felt like didn't add to the story? I don't know if you guys have had this impulse. Maybe you have had this issue before, but I, uh, so I, I would draw fictional comics, but I would, you know, it's just like you love to include autobiographical details mm -hmm. in. So I would include a lot of like bars and just like food places. But then what you learn is like comics take forever to make and so quickly these bars just disappear and it's like your comic lasts longer than these places that hold so many of your life memories. It's very strange. So now I just try to like not do that. <laughs> or like with, I mean like not, it's certainly nothing that would date a comic in a strange way. Like I think, okay, my first mini comic I used a character says something about MySpace, and then like a <laughs> month later, Facebook was the only thing. So I was like, yeah. I'll never do that again. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Stupid. I feel like I've miscast people sometimes. Like I, I, my characters are bad actors, and they're not exactly what I wanted. And um, there's just been a couple instances that I, I was like, I should have made that person's hair a different color or them say a slightly different thing. Like I, I think cast, casting, in your, I mean you have unlimited casting, but uh, I think it's a big deal and sometimes yeah. um, I feel like I've done 
I wish it was just a little different, you know. I can't even think of a specific example, but I, I know that there have been things when I get through, I'm like, I wish it was drawn in a slightly different way, or I wish that character was just a little bit different. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, before we go, Um, if everybody could just let um, everyone know what their table is and if they have any new work so you can go check out all of their work. It's all excellent. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. And if you want to just go around. Um, I'm at table 70, the youth in decline table. I have two new minis. Uh, I'm at the ad house table, which is the short wall near the entrance. I don't know the number. I'm at uh, 2122, and I'm with Self Made Hero, and I just have the book that just came out there. And I'm at Uncivilized Books. If you walk all the way to the end of the hall and, and go in the last door, that we're right there. It's H12. And I have a n relatively newish book out called Everything is Flammable. <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>